Father Lord, we thank you for who you are. We exalt and honor you because of your privilege given to us today to share your word in the midst of a crook and a preserved generation. You are the Lord, and that is your name. Your glory cannot be given to another. Your praise cannot be given to either. This evening is another opportunity for us to share the gospel of your people, to prophesy the good news which you have shown before time to your people. Father Lord, today, be the first day of the week, is the day that you have made, that we should rejoice and be glad in it. Father, make known to us your way. We are set to search some enigma, some hard saying in the scripture. Father Lord, hidden things belongs to you, but the things that are revealed, they belong to us. Open our eyes to behold the things that are equal, that in everything, your name is Lord, will be glorified. Holy Spirit, no man can explain the word of God, but you are the one that can expand it to us. Expand your word to your people this day. As many that come to this message with a heavy heart, let everybody be loosened. And let yoke be broken. Let fighters and chains be broken completely. As many that stick, let them receive the divine healing. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, you are welcome again to the presence of God. This is a great opportunity for us to flourish in the sight of our God. Today, we are set to begin another new study in our Open House Fellowship, Understanding Prophecy. So today's topic on that Understanding Prophecy has to do with the book of Revelation. Our text is taken from Revelation 17 down to 18. Last week we started this topic about the mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. The Bible called the Great Hall that sits upon many water. Last week we were able to establish the fact that if this woman was a harlot, does not symbolize sexual immorality, but it has to do with idolatry. And because physical fornication might be impossible for a community or a town or a city. But spiritual fornication is very possible, which is idolatry. So when the Bible was telling us for the sake of idolatry, divorce is possible, as Christ revealed to us in the book of Matthew, he was actually talking of idolatry, not physical immorality. Although fornication engulfs physical immorality, but he also covers idolatry. Having a carnal knowledge with another God, God considered it as harlotry to himself. Today, I will be your host. My name is Missionary Collins Adoge. I will be teaching you on this series of topics. Understanding prophecy. What is the purpose of this teaching? The purpose is not to threaten you or frighten you concerning the times of the end, but to equip the saints, to prepare them for the need to evangelize to the unrich people, to make them understand that death is not the end of life, that there is a beginning and there is also an end. The purpose of this teaching is to equip the saints with the right knowledge for our church. This gospel is given to save life now, before it is too late. I don't believe God reads the book of Revelation just as a vision for the standard by to just read and move through. The purpose is for our church. In this very book, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and he open, I will come into him and I will suck with him and he with me forever. The purpose is for the gospel of the kingdom to be used as a testimony against all nations. That is the purpose. The Bible says, if we know the wrath of God, we will persuade men. This is the purpose why 
this gospel was given so that men will understand that God will commit all things into judgment, whether we have done good or evil. So as a result, it will inform their life decision, emulate or formulate character change. That is the purpose of today's teaching. God bless you as you listen. Today, we shall be reading our text from the book of Revelation chapter 17, from verse 2. We say, whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the world were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. How possible is that? The kings of the earth committed fornication with her. They worship her idols. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication, the deception. There is a kind of idolatry we have not emulated to last week. But today, this week, we are going to explore it. That's false doctrine. False doctrine. Deceiving the people to worship idol in the pretense of worshiping God. This is another form of idolatry that many Christians are not aware of. The first prophet, remember in the book of Revelation, one of the key figures of the first prophet was that he persuaded them that dwell upon the earth to worship the image of the beast. How was that possible? False doctrine. False doctrine. Idolatry. Using image in worshiping. Remember God said in the book of Exodus that Thou shalt not make unto the Lord thy God any graven image, in likeness of anything in heaven, or on earth, or under the earth. But when men begin to make unto God graven image, in likeness of four-footed beasts, in likeness of man, in likeness of dove, God make it clear to Moses, to the children of Israel, that when he appeared to Moses on the mountain, that he did not see shape. Neither did they see form, that they should not make unto him, they only heard a voice, so they should not make unto him any graven image. It can be in likeness of a man, it can be in likeness of a woman, it can be in likeness of a worship host or angels, or even of Jesus Christ. You should not make unto the Lord your God any graven image. It is an abomination unto the Lord. That is the format of the Antichrist. How do you know the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet? It would not be difficult to examine a false prophet or determine who is a false prophet from a, false, from a real prophet. The only difference is by his works. The works he shows. Remember, when God said to the children of Israel, after he delivered them from the hand of the Egyptian, from the terrible grief of Pharaoh, he did not force them into the promised land. But rather he said to them, I put life on my hammer and death on my heaven, but I can sell you to choose life that you and your generation might live. He only can sell you to choose the rights to choice which man took in Genesis by himself, exists even with God. God respects that boundary. The man has a choice to make. In the building of the new earth, man has a choice. In the decision how he lives his life, man has a choice. In the decision whether to serve and who to serve, man has a choice. In the decision whether to obey the laws of the lands, or the reading that ordinances of kings, man has a choice. But when an emperor or a leader or a ruler comes into the group, telling you that your choice are not relevant, that now we will make choice for you because you are not competent enough to think for yourself, or be forced to swear an allegiance to any man or any kind of things, it's no longer 
the rights of man, but your right has been taken away. This proves to you the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet. Remember, when Gideon cut down the bar and destroyed his altar and cut the grove that was in it, the Bible did not tell us his father handed him over to the idol worshiper that he should be killed by them. But what does the father say to those that sought his life? O ye men of Israel, will you plead for Baal? If Baal be a god, let him defend himself. Anybody that will plead for Baal, let the person be put to death while it is still money. But today we have a lot of religious leaders pleading on behalf of God, leading a holy war in the name of defending a God who claimed to have power of creation. If God has power of creation, don't you think he has the power to defend himself from aggressors? For anyone that cast down his law? For anyone that burns his books? For anyone that offends him in any manner? But if God cannot fight for himself and he rely on man who he created to fight on his behalf, that means he is no God but just an empty prayer. Then Christians should notice that you may be jealous of God, but that does not mean that your zeal should lead you to commit murder. Remember what God says to Cain in the beginning. Whoever killed Cain, the sin of Cain shall be visited upon him seventy times seven. But when you now have a false prophet who contained the politics, three times in the life of Jesus, they tried to take him by force and made him king. But he resisted them and flew from the midst of them. When you now have a religious leader who is an emperor, who claimed to be the rulers of the whole world, or the rulers of the people, this is preamble for disaster because God has not made any man rulers over his house. God gave us a lot of dominion in Genesis, but a set one dominion over another man did he not give to us. Men must be allowed to make their own decision as for who their leader should be. Even when the children of Israel reject God as their king, by choosing for themselves king, God did not force them to remain under his grief. He gave them their self-determination. And he told them, he told Samuel to appoint a king for them, that they have not rejected Samuel, but they have rejected him. So, brethren, today, when you see people go contrary to the scriptures, and they claim they do it in the name of God, we should know what this, who that decision is coming from. There is only one person in the book of Isaiah that wants to sit upon the mountain of congregation, that wants to ascend to heaven to be like God over the people. But that was not what God did in Genesis, was it? God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. If the size of that voice alone symbolizes cooperation, God believe in unity. God believe in collaboration. God believe in partnership with man, with his angels, with his Godhead bodies. That is whom God is. But when you have not heard somebody in the name of God say, I will, then you should run from such a congregation. Because that is not the voice of God. Because God never said, I will throughout the entire scripture. I have read many biblical prophecies and all the 66 book of the Bible, but I have never seen where God says, I will. No. It is always in collaboration with his elders. Christians should be careful of those who come as wolf in sheep clothing. Because the Antichrist does not mean in place of Christ. It means, it does not mean someone who is like Christ. 
He meets someone who put himself in place of Christ. He is going to deceive you by peace. First peace that promises world unity. Remember, there cannot be peace except you invite the Prince of Peace. You cannot live in your sin and expect peace. You can't eat your cake and have it. If you want peace in the world, embrace the Prince of Peace. You will have peace. But if you don't embrace the Prince of Peace, whose hand belongs to your peace, your peace you are seeking for, in any format, in any bullet, in any gun head, is a mirage. And true peace can never exist without the one who owns it. You can't reject the owner of the house and claim to own the house. It's not possible. You cannot fight your way to peace. You cannot push your way to peace. You cannot legislate your way to peace. It doesn't exist. Peace is a consensual only whom the prince of peace himself can give. It pass human understanding. It is uncomprehensible. And that's how the world will be deceived. How will they be deceived? One promising you peace by things you see. By forcing peace. Crushing every opposition. That does not make peace. Defeating your enemy and forcing them to be quiet. That is not peace. That is tyranny. If you want peace, you must follow the rudiment of the Prince of Peace himself. Only he can give peace. But today, we are going to study the character of a false prophet. I will not care to understand or to name who that false prophet will be. But we all know him as the false prophet. This false prophet, his reign will be disastrous for the inhabitants of the earth. The Bible says, He made them that dwell upon the earth worship the beast. The beast is a world government. It is almost impossible for people to even love a world government, not to talk of worshipping him. But this Antichrist play a key role in ensuring that worship by converting a world government into a religious organization. Has there been emperor worship before in history? Certainly. Throughout the Dark Ages and the ancient time, we have emperor worship. Nero was planted, Augustus Caesar, and they all involved in emperor worship. Even in Egyptian, as the ancient time, the Egyptian worshipped the Pharaoh as he was a god. So, Emperor worship has been consistent in history. It is not a strange thing that even today, though we no longer have emperor worship, people still worship the emperor through their decree. In many countries of the earth, Christianity and worship, any form of Christian worship or God's service are banned. And the leader delegates such worship to himself and such authority to himself, though he be not legally implanted as a status to be worshipped, but indirectly forcing people to worship him. He makes a commandment that I guess the scriptures and force the people to obey. This is an emperor worship. This is not different from what the Antichrist will do, but the difference is that this man do it to a country or to a state or to a people or to a village or to a community. But the Antichrist will do it to the entire world. Remember why God destroyed the Torah of Babel in Genesis chapter 6. The reason is simple. Men want to be one, united, build a city that will reach out to heaven, and they will not be scattered throughout the surface of the earth. But this is not God's plan for man. But this is what the world today are planning for themselves. But this is not God's plan. God wants man to be scattered in all the surface of the earth. 
He told us to multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. Does it mean man is against environmental or God is against environmental practice? No. God promised us to take care of the earth, to nourish it. Not taking care of the earth will we attract God's judgment if we don't. God expects us to take care of our world. That's why when He created man, Adam and Eve, He put them in a garden, He gave them contrast to dress flowers. Because man should be with labor. Man should take care of the creation. Man should name the animal. Why do you have to name the animal to foster companionship? To bring them closer to you. But that was the purpose why God created man. God wants man to foster the earth. To create companionship. To name the beast and to tame them. To have dominion over it. To control it. Because whatever you can name, you can control. So if man could give name to the beast, he has the ability to control them. So it is not strange when men control God's creation. What about the heavens? Were they created for man? Yes. God spread out the heaven as a tent for man to dwell in. Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, whatever you call it, all the stars in the galaxies are to be a habitation for man if the world could not contain us. Man was given enough wisdom at creation to sterilize those earths, to prepare them as a home for man to dwell in. But men forced their plan when they rebelled against God. When they sought for ability to master good and evil as well. Listen today, if all the power and the energy we use in developing what is evil, knowledge of evil, and to execute evil, to wipe out human race from the earth, if we spend half of it in building the things that are good, man will frost us. Space will be the smallest domain for man to reach. If men can come together in knowledge, in unity, in power, in vision, the world will be a small domain for us to process. But either, in every good thing man invents, man invents 350 evil things. When man brought the internet, people were happy. We cannot talk with people from a distance. But what happened next? Cyber hacking come in. We now begin to have cyber terrorists. And the higher the internet, the faster they grow. They, are, they grow faster than the rate of the internet. The same thing with the weapon of mass destruction. We create car. We use the same car for the destruction of the earth and for mankind. Everything man's events, one good, 20 evil. That was not because God gave that to them in creation. God gave man enough wisdom in the creation to be able to name anything that he wants to come to pass. But man said it was not enough. He sought for himself an additional ability, the knowledge of evil, to master it and to desire it. And no wonder God said to Cain, why are you angry with your brother? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If not, sin is knocking at your door. The desire is yours. If you desire it, you will master it. And that is what I have to say to you today. If you do what is right, you will be accepted. But if, you, if not, evil is knocking at your door. The desire belongs to you. If you desire it, you will master it. And the Bible says in 17, verse 3, He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman clothed with a scarlet color beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven head and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple scarlet and adorned with gold of precious stones. 
and pills, having a golden cup full of abomination of filthiness of her fornication. The golden cup does not symbolize drink, it symbolizes the blood of her fornication, the matters that has gone as a result of her idol worship. He forced the inhabitants of the earth to worship idol. And because as many that would not worship his idol were killed, you don't force people to worship God. You persuade them to worship God. No man that forced you to worship God is inviting you to worship a true God. God does not force people to believe in him. Just like the occult, they can never tell you the secrets. All they can tell you is come. Come. They showed you fancy picture of blessing, but they never tell you the detail. But God is the only one that will tell you the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. He will establish and make all things plain before you sign a contract of agreement with him. So, he called the children of Israel together and he said to them, Choose you these days, whom you will serve, whether the God of the lands you now live, or the God of today world, or you will serve the God of Egyptians, from which land I carry you away from. And the prophet said unto the children of Israel, But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the same question God is asking you today, to choose these days whom you will serve. Are you going to serve the God of the scientists of the world? Or the God of the world powers? And the socialists that rules the world? Or are you going to serve the living God? Choose these days whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. In verse 5, on her forehead was written, Mystery, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of heart and all abomination of the earth. The mother of heart. That means this harlotry we're talking about or idolatry in this teaching. It's not one. They are many. She, at the end, many false Christ will arise. Many false prophets will arise. So we are not talking of one false prophet here. We are talking of many. The Bible says, because the one that restrained will be taken out of the way. And who is the restrainer? The Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the earth, you know what happened? All the crooked, evil forces that were held back by the Holy Spirit will be manifested in their time. And that is exactly what happened here. Because many false prophets will arise and they will have powers to do many signs and wonders, even to give life to a dead image. So that the image can speak and cause sacrifice to be brought to him. And the Bible says, they will show so much sign, if it were possible, they would have deceived even the very elect of God. This is what the earth is aiming towards, or working towards. It's a time of trouble, such as has never been since there was a nation on the surface of the earth. And we pray it should not happen in our time. Brethren, let's be wise. The Bible made it clear to us that I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Why? Is this woman drunk with the blood of the saints? He is also drunk with the blood of the mitre of Jesus Christ himself. That the city which Jesus was speaking about here is the city that was responsible for the death of all the saints. 
put together. And in the same city that was responsible for the death of Christ, and we knew who those cities are, I don't need to point it to you. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Why? Why would you marvel? It's because this is a religious city who was well renowned for religious, persecuting the saints because they refused to worship her idols. That was why John marveled. Now, and the angel said, why does thou marvel? The meaning of the woman and the beast that carried her. Hmm. And the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carried her, which has seven horns. Seven hair and ten more. The beast that you saw was and is not. And we are sent out of the bottomless pit and goes into perdition. The city you see is not today. <laughs> and it was in the past. And we are sent out of the bottomless pit. And it goes into perdition. So God is not talking to us. A city that was. He's talking about a city that once existed on top of the surface of the earth. And it was not at a point in time. But this city will as rise in the end of the world. And it will go into perdition. And what is this city? That the Bible call is the Assyria. The Assyria. How did we know that? The Bible says, When the Assyria shall come into my land, then will I raise against him seven principal men and seven shepherds, and they shall destroy the Assyrians of my land. So, marvel not at what you heard. Those who dwell in the earth will marvel, whose name are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is, the beasts are seven kingdoms. You will go further. Let me just read. Here is the mind of him that hath wisdom. Whenever the Bible uses that tense, he's about to open some mystery. Or enigma which require spiritual knowledge and understanding of the scriptures to be able to reveal because this is talking about the mind that has the wisdom of God just as Daniel has to be able to open this mystery the seven heads are seven mountain on which the woman sits and now we know that this woman from our previous lecture, she is a city. And because she is a city, sit upon seven hills. There are many cities on earth that sit upon seven hills. But I said, not all the city was responsible for the matters of Jesus. And not all the city was responsible for the slaughter of the apostles in the biblical days, or was the word emperor during the time Christ was on top of the surface of the earth. Then, let's go further. This, there are also seven kings. Five of those kings have what? Fallen. And one is. Five fallen. Maybe we can just start by naming the five that has fallen. In the days John was writing. Egypt gone. Assyria, gone. The Babylonian, under Nebuchadnezzar, gone. The Medes and the Persian, gone. 
The Medes and the Persian gone, that is four kingdom. The Grecian Empire fallen. Five have fallen. And one is which empire was in force in the time of John, the Roman Empire. At the time John was speaking, the Roman Empire was in force. So five indeed has fallen. The one is was the Roman, and the other was not yet come. Which other was yet to come? The revived Roman Empire was not yet come. And the Bible says when he comes, he will continue just for a short period of time. Today, we are not there yet. They are still trying to revive. And he said when he comes at the end, they will only continue for a short period of time. And the beast that was and is not, he himself is the eighth of the empire. He is not the Roman Empire, as many Christians suggest. No. He is the eighth, but he is coming out of the revived Roman Empire, which is the seven. And he is the one that is the eighth empire on the surface of the earth which will be revived worldwide, the kingdom of the Antichrist. So no kingdom of the earth today is that kingdom because his kingdom has not started. For his kingdom to start, the Antichrist must rise to power. For the Antichrist to rise from, to power, the sense must be gone from the surface of the earth. So nobody can predict that kingdom today. But we know he is coming at off the revived Roman Empire, which is the seven. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as out of yet. They have not received any form of kingdom now. They receive kingdom, authority or kingdom, one hour with the beast. Let's point a full stop here. When the Bible used the word one hour, he is not talking about 16 minute hour. He is talking about spotlights, the same time with the Antichrist. This kingdom reign in the period of the Antichrist. These ten kings don't have any kingdom today, they don't have any authority. On the surface of the earth now, don't point to any existing kingdom to be this ten kingdom. They don't exist today. So, in verse 13, these have one mind. The kings of this ten kingdom, they're going to be united with one mind. And that mind is to give the authority over to the beast. Because today people wonder, how possible is it for all nations of the earth to hand their authority over to one man to become their president? The Bible says, this king that will rise at this time, they have one purpose, one mind. And they will agree and hand their authority over to the Antichrist. That is how it's going to happen. So stop predicting. This make war with the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. And the Lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Chosen and faithful. We know who are the chosen. So stop trying to search your Bible for the chosen. They are the 144,000 chosen from the 12 tribe of Israel, who has the Father's name on their forehead. Who were virgins, who were redeemed from the earth, who no guilt or sin was ever found. They were redeemed from under the law, not under grace. So they were servants to God. Those are those who are with Christ. Because in him was found no guilt. 
no sin was found in his mouth. So those that will help him to convince the devil and to convict him are not those born under grace. But those who have kept the laws of God, who were virgins, who no sin was found in their mouths. And these are the people that will go with the Lamb wherever he goes. These are the people that will make the devil to be speechless, that righteousness can indeed come out from the earth. Remember what he said in the days of Job, from walking to and fro the earth, and from walking up and down in it. But this time, God is going to tell him like he told prophet Elijah, Elijah that he still reserved in Israel 7,000 men who have not bowed their feet to bow, nor kiss his ring. God will prove to the Antichrist. That's why you have a lot of the world population as a trophy. I still have 144,000 who has not bowed their knees to sin. And in verse 18, And the woman whom you saw is a great city, like we said she was, which reign, reigns over the kings of the earth. This city was a great city. We knew there was seven. The city that reigned in the days of John was not America. It was not Europe. It was the Roman Empire. So this city is the city he was talking about. The fall of Babylon the Great. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having a great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And the angel cried with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, and is fallen, and it has become the dwelling place of demon, and a prison for every false for every false spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hateful bed. Every unclean and hateful bed. Indeed, this city at the end of the world become a place for the dwelling place of demons. And every unclean and hateful spirit. Because though it was supposed to be a religious city, but it became a place where demons dwelt. For all nations has drawn the rot of her fornication, and the king of the earth was not exempted from her fornication. She prophesied false doctrine, had carnal knowledge, and fled away from his God into perversity with other gods. And the merchant of the earth has become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Indeed, this city was a rich city. Rich in gold, rich in silver, rich in sacrament, rich in slave, rich in anything you can talk about. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. Who is he calling to come out of her? The saints. My people, the people of God, lest you should share in her sin, lest you receive of her plagues. This is the first city God is saying to the saint to come out of her. In the place of Jerusalem, he sent them to flee to the mountain. But now he is telling you to come out from that city because nothing will be spared in that city of destruction. For her sins, and this city also happened to be the city of the first prophet who made the inhabitants of the earth believe in the Antichrist. For her sins have reached 
up to heaven and God has remembered her iniquity. Because the sin she committed all through the ages men thought, oh, God is not listening. A time came that Christians were being used for sports for the gladiators to kill. And many people were slaughtered just because they have a manuscript of the scripture, the Bible. Some were killed by refusing to worship idolatry or to profane the body of Christ through the Holy Communion. And as a result, many martyrs died and their life and their tears were written in the book of God. Remember what God said in the book of Revelation to the martyrs that they should hold on until all the number of the saints that will be killed as they were were completed. This time, the judgment time has come upon the great city. Render to her as she has rendered to you. Repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has missed, miss double for her. God is saying to the saints, every evil this woman has done or this city has done to the church all through the ages, do double to them. And strange enough, all congregational churches of the earth emanate from this particular great city. And that's why God called them harlots. She was not the only harlot, but the rest of the churches were harlots. Only she was the mother of them all. She was the mother of false doctrine. And every false doctrine on the surface of the earth the tree that my father has not planted, Jesus said, shall be rooted out. And this tree was not obviously planted by God. The apostles laid a foundation. The saints has the administration. But this foundation of this woman was different from the one God laid. And so because it was not laid by God, it shall be uprooted out. And God is saying to the saint, feel to her double for her double. In the measure that she glorify herself and live luxuriously, the measure, the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she said in her heart, I sit as queen, I am no widow, I shall see no sorrow. Deliberately contrasting herself with Jerusalem. Same because Jerusalem was called widow and divorced. But this woman says she is not a widow, she is a queen. She sat as queen, so she is no widow. And therefore she shall see no sorrow. She will not go through hunger. She is ready to prostitute the gospel in order for this, in order for her to leave delicacies and get earthly wet and glory. But the Lord said, Therefore, her plague shall come in one day. God is given a specific time. One day, death, money, famine, and she shall be utterly burnt with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judge her. God destroyed Sodom. God destroyed the world as sin. The Bible did not say strong was the God that judged those words. But here God is saying to this woman that strong was the God that judged her. Because she has done great things. And so the sting of her torment will come up forever. Because indeed she has done great things. The word more Babylon's fall. Why would the word more for Babylon for? Because she has a relations with all the inhabitants of the earth. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and live luxuriously with her shall weep and lament her when they see her torment. When they see the smoke of her burning 
are sending off. Standing at a distance for fear of her torments. <laughs> Nobody could go close to her because of the torments. Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon. That great city. For in one hour, your judgment has come. And the merchant of the sea shall weep and mourn over her, because she is the mistress of trade in the ocean. And all chariots and all trade in the world route cannot be completed without this ancient Roman Empire, which is also known as the revived Roman Empire. And then the eighth city, which is the city of the Antichrist. For no one buys their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and of silver and of precious stone and of pearl, fine linen, purple, zinc, scarlet, and every kind of citron wood, and every kind of object of ivory, and every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, marbles, sycamore, incense, fragment oil, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flowers, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, bodies, and even in addition, the souls of men. They all depend on this system. They are responsible for the sales of all this one, including the souls of all who sales of evil that take the souls of men to hell. It's also a trade that depends on this city. The fruits that your soul longed for has come forth from you, and all things which are rich and splendid have gone from you. You shall find them no more at all forever. The merchants of these things, who became rich by her, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. And say, alas, alas, that great city that has that was plotted in the fine linens and the purple and the scarlet and adorned with great with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour your great riches come to nothing. And the sheep makers and all who travel by sea, sheep, sailors, and many, as many that are strayed on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her body, saying, Ooh, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their head and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who have sheep on the sea became rich by her works. For in one hour, she is made desolate. Now we understand that the works of the earth are nothing. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? If for the, what you will eat, how you will grow, or influence you can control or weep, lies against the ways of truth. How shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation which was first spoken of by angels and was prophesied by them that heard him? And God confirming it in every church through his son Jesus Christ and through the giving of his Holy Spirit to them that love his appearance. Now, in verse 20, the Lord is commanding his saints to rejoice. This is the first time that judgment was executed in the scripture and God commanded his saints to rejoice. He said, rejoice over her, O heavens, and you holy apostles and the prophets, because somehow this city was connected to the slaughter of the apostles and prophets. For God has avenged you on her. Because she specialized in killing Christians, in wiping out apostles and prophets all through the scriptures. That was the specialty of this city. 
the blood of all the apostles of Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ himself, the blood of John the Baptist, they were formed in the hand of this city. Finality of Babylon 4. The mighty angel took up a great stone, like as if it were a mist stone, and threw it into the sea, saying, Toss with violence, this great city, Babylon, shall be thrown down, and shall not be found anymore. And the sound of chariots, musicians, flutists, trumpeters, shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsmen of any craft shall be found in you anymore. The sound of mistone shall be not be heard in you anymore. The light of lamp shall not shine in you anymore. The voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. And by your sorcery, all nations were deceived. The deception of nations. The deception of the kings of the earth came from this city. And in her was found the blood of the prophets, the blood of the saints, and of all who were slain in the earth. And this city is indeed a terrible city. And God has avenged the saints on them. This judgment is a preamble. Or the final showdown of the events in the book of Revelation. Next week, we shall be looking at the final showdown of events. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven singing, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, honor, power belongs to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he had judged the great heart, who corrupts the earth with her fornication, and was avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke arises up forever and ever. The twenty and four and the Twenty and four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then the voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God for all you, his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many water, as the sound of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And let us be glad and rejoice, and give glory to him, for the marriage feast of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. The judgment is executed upon the wicked. And the feast of the Lord has come. This is a wonderful proclamation for the saints. That knowing that the blood of the prophets, the blood of the apostles, and the blood of the Christians that was shed in this great city will not be left unatoned for. And this punishment will come upon this great city. And upon all them that put their trust in her. Just as God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with an overthrow, so shall this city of the false prophets be destroyed. So this is a warning for all those who rely on the fallacies and the hypocrisy that this false prophet will shed in this end time. God is warning you before time that you should not believe in any man who forces you to worship, who tells you under commandments or cajole you with fancy words 
and deceive you with false peace and things that does not pertain to the scriptures and things that are not after the scriptures telling you God has made idolatry with Christianity turn Christian worship or idol festival be careful God is going to judge all things whether good or evil and that's why he said to you in the book of Revelation he that is holy let it be holy still he that is just let it be just still he that is faithful let it be faithful still do you know why he is coming quickly and his reward is with him to give every man according to his reward shall be and behold in 19 verse 11 I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on him is called Faithful and True. Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judged and make war. So many of you Christians who are still dreaming of heaven, seeing Jesus Christ as a little boy, or as a little child, I think it's time to change your revelation. Because the Jesus we are talking about in this end time, He's not coming to you as a little child or as a little boy. He is the one who rides upon the horse, whose name is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judged and make war. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except he himself alone. And he was crotted with a robe deep in blood, the blood he shed for us. And his name is called the Word of God. Once in my dream has I seen him, he was terrible to look upon. And then at the end, he told me his name was the word of God. Then I knew when I read this book that his name, Jesus, is the word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linens, white and clean, follow him on white charts. Who are these armies in heaven? The saints, the righteous saints, they coming with him. They are not coming with him they are not coming with him to die the second time. They are coming with him to take possession of the whole earth. To uproot the kings of the earth. And to set up a kingdom of God. A literal kingdom, not a spiritual kingdom. On the surface of the whole world. And to repair the world that man has destroyed from the beginning. So the repairing of the earth will be done by himself, not by scientists. He is coming to repair the world. Root out all the false prophets and sin. As much as climate and everything can destroy the world, what destroys the world faster than all is sin. Sin destroys the world. One sin can lead to the death of a million people. So, Sin is a great killer, even than environmental or anything. If the world wants to be saved or preserved, let them avoid sin. And he was clothed with the vessels deep in the blood that he splits for mankind. He always remembered his covenant. His blood was shed for the remission of our sin. And his name is called the Word of God. And his armies in heavens, clotted in fine linens, and the white and clean, follows on him, which is the righteousness of the saints. White and clean, meaning, because the Bible says all human righteousness are as filthy rag. But the fact that the linens the saints were wearing were white and clean, that means it was not their righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ which he gave them through his blood. 
is known as the righteousness of the saints. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Many people keep saying, does he have a sword in his mouth? No. The sword is the word of God by which he smits the nation that with it he shall strike the nations. <laughs> the word of God. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. Remember Psalm 2. He said, ask of me. I will give you the heating for your inheritance. And the utmost part of the earth for your procession, you will have authority to break it with a rod of iron, to dash it to pieces as the potter dashes his verse. And this is the Son of God. He has the authority to break the nation to pieces with a rod of iron. That's why God said you should cancel him with peace. Don't try to make war with him. Or else you will be consumed when his wrath is quickly kindled. He himself treads the wine press. Remember the same wine press you read about in Isaiah chapter 63. When he said, Who is he that cometh from Eden with a dyed garment from Bozrah? It is I that speak in righteousness and mighty to save. And he said, I have tread the wine press alone. I have tread it. Because the prophet asked him, how come you are ready you are prayer? I know when you are coming, you are white as snow. But your vessel will only deep in blood. But how come now you are white? You are, your remnant is stains with blood. Not the blood is shed on the cross. But the blood of those who he slain. He said, I tread in one person. I tread it in my anger. And of those that were with me, I didn't need them for this. I tread them in the fury of the Almighty God. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my ramets, and I will stain on my ramets. That is what he says. The, knowing the terror of God will persuade you to weakness for him. And he will tread in one press in the fierceness and the rocks of the Almighty God. This is quoting exactly Isaiah 63. And he has in his robe and on his tie a name written, Kings of Kings and Lord of Lords, King of all the kings of the earth and Lord of all the lords of the earth. He is the one. He is the one that the kings of the earth must lift up the gate for. For he is the king of glory. He is the Lord strong and mighty. He is the Lord mighty in battle. No man can overtake him in battle. And he's not going to resign. You can't sack him. Let us pray. Lord, the I am that I am. The omnipotent and the messiahs. The word of God. The concrete root of David. The one who is and the one who are. And the one who is to come. The one that nobody can sack. And the one that is never going to resign. I call upon you, O Lord. Let your word be accessible to the heart of men. Use this word to draw men to your name. Because you say if we know the terror of you, the word of God, we will persuade men. Father, let this word raise a terror in us that force us to persuade men to believe. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless you, brethren. This is where we end up today's teaching. Join us again on Sunday next week as we open more prophetic utterances. We shall be looking next week into the final showdown of biblical events. There we will have opportunity to exploit the final return of Christ in the battle of Megiddo, the gathering together of the children of Israel, and the restoration of all things, and the judgments being delivered to the saints. God bless you as you participate. Amen. Brethren, if you have missed any of our messages, we have started this book of Revelation from Revelation chapter 1 and we have taken it now to Revelation chapter 19. And God bless you, we shall continue as we take the whole biblical prophecy throughout the entire scripture. If you miss any of our teaching, go to our website at cgfnslogin.app cgfnslogin.app which is also in the page or you can search it on 
our Facebook page, which is CGF Open House Fellowship. And you can get most of the videos that we have passed and watch it and learn from yourself. These teachings are free and they are meant to prepare you for the final showdown of events. The Bible says, watch. And again, I say to you today, watch. Because you don't know what time your Lord does come. You don't know. The Bible says, when they shall say, there is peace. Sudden destruction will come upon them. Like a woman in travail with a charge. God bless you. And I say to you, see again, watch. Because if the good house owner has known in what hour of the night the thief doth come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken into. But I say to you, watch that you should not walk naked, so that when he come, you will have your garments. God bless you as you continue to watch in Jesus' name.